Now we turn our attention to the scriptures, to an invitation to dream together. That's what we've been talking about over the last few weeks is this idea of dreaming a little dream, that, that we need your dreams. We need dreams of the past so we might have dreams for the future, that those dreams might need a plan. And today we, we want to spend a little time talking about what we do with those plans, what we do with those dreams, how we make them a reality what that looks like in each of our lives. Thank you to those of you who have participated already. We've got a, a dream wall going out uh, in our Welcome Center, and I've just loved reading some of those dreams, some of those dreams for this church, some of those dreams for this community, some of those dreams for you personally. I love that. I love it because here's what I believe, that God has even bigger dreams for us than the ones that we can imagine. All we need to do is live into them. So today I want to share a story from the scriptures out of Genesis chapter 28. The story of a dreamer it comes from Genesis chapter 28. We'll read verses 10 through 22. Hear this word this morning. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and he stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth. The top of it reached to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and all the families on the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid. And said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and he set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called the place Bethel. The name of the city was Luz at first. Then Jacob made a vow, saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in his way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I can come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God, and this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And all that you give me, I will surely give one-tenth to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, as we open your word, we pray that you would open our hearts, that we might commit to following your dream for us today. Our commitment might make a difference in this world, in this church, in this community. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Jacob came to a certain place. What an interesting way to describe some, somewhere, just a certain place. Like it's, it's not anywhere special, it's just a, a certain place that Jacob happened to be in between here and there. Came to a certain place. I love it that the story of Jacob involves Jacob meeting God in this unexpected place. So, some of the best memories we probably have in life involve a certain place, don't they? Some of our dreams became realities in certain places, or at least got their start. Most of us, as we think back about our life, we can put certain pins in certain places and say, this is where this happened, or this is where this happened, or, or this is where I began to think about this, or this is where I knew this. I, I remember, I remember a place at Andrews, North Carolina, we had taken a, a group of students on a whitewater rafting trip. I remember the little pine cabin we were staying in with those kids. I remember the smell of the pine. I remember the way that cabin felt. And I remember this overwhelming sense that God was inviting me to do this for the rest of my life, to share 
the fullest life possible through Jesus Christ with people. I knew that I knew that I knew in that place, in that unexpected place, on that unexpected weekend. I remember, I remember so vividly that a little restaurant in Tarpon Springs, Florida. I remember the night that I proposed to Michelle there. I remember how the tables were arranged. I remember the other people that were sitting nearby us. I remember the color of the tablecloths. I remember that certain place. I I remember how the carpet felt as I kneeled down. It was older carpet. (laughs) I remember kneeling down and I remember saying something like, <laughs> and her just wrapping her arms around me, which I assumed was yes. I remember that place so well. Places matter to us, places where our dreams became realities. But, but we continue to dream about places, don't we? I, I love thinking about places that I'd love to go, and, and I can see them so clearly in my mind. And I, I love talking to my kids about the places that they would love to go as well. My, my youngest son is really obsessed with Steve Irwin right now, so he would love to go to Australia. He wants to go and see Australia Zoo. And in his mind, he can describe to you what it's going to look like, what that place is going to be like. My daughter would love to go out west and see the wild Mustangs. She'd really love to bring one home. (laughs) Only one of us has that dream. (laughs) It's not me. She can describe what it might feel like, what it might look like. She has dreams of what could be and what should be. My oldest son wants to go to to explore Europe. He he loves European culture. He loves learning about Europe. He he learns different languages really quickly. He loves studying that stuff. He would love to go spend some time in Germany. He talks about going to college in Slovenia. Everybody's got their own dreams. Everybody's got their own dreams. I love it. He can describe what that might be like. He thinks about it. He dreams about it. Places matter. Jacob comes to a place. Jacob comes to a certain place where he encounters God. And lots of us have had those sort of experiences right here in this place, haven't we? This place that at one point was nothing but grass and trees. Someone had a dream for a place where people might come together and they could see it They could see it in their minds, what it might be like for people like us to gather together and to worship in a space like this, what it might be like for people to encounter God through Christ in a place like this, what it might be like to have incredible music that moves us in such meaningful ways in a place like this, for people to walk in the doors and say, truly God was in this place And I didn't even know it. Jacob encounters God in this place in between. In between here and there, this this certain spot that becomes so important to him. A place that I'm sure he could describe to you perfectly today. Jacob shows up in that place. And if you haven't read Jacob's story, you'll know that he was a bit of a, he had had a bit of a past. I mean, he he tricked his brother out of his birthright. He, He swindled his father out of a blessing. And then he has to take off from his home because his brother is threatening to kill him. Jacob shows up in this place carrying a lot of weight. Jacob shows up with a history, with a past, with things he doesn't want to talk about, with things he doesn't want to share. Having lived in his own power and by his own will for so long, he shows up in this place. 
And he's tired and he's weary from the road and he's weary from carrying his weight. And he, he finally gets a moment where he can set it down and lays down to go to sleep. On a rock, the story tells us. Here's how you know Jacob didn't have much. Because he lays down on a rock. I mean, if you had some clothes, you might bundle them up underneath your head. If you had a sleeping bag, you might put it under your head. If, if you had any livestock, you might pull a sheep real close. I don't know. That's what I would do, but... You can tell Jacob doesn't have much because he lays his head down on a rock and he begins to rest. The weary traveler rests and has this encounter with God. He's able to lay his stuff down to find a moment of peace where he's truly able to encounter something more in this world than his own Will, his own doings, his own behaviors, his own actions. He, he's able to see more. And, and God shows up and says, Welcome to this place of hope, of dreams, of refuge. In fact, if, if you look up the, the Hebrew word for rock in this scripture, it's the word eben, uh, where we get the, the word Ebenezer. Come thou fount of every blessing, here I raise my Ebenezer. It literally just means a rock. But it also implies in the Hebrew language a place of refuge. Jacob finally finds a place of refuge where he's able to rest and lay aside those worries, those hurts, those pains, those broken places in his life, a place of refuge just like so many of us have found in this place. And God speaks to Jacob and he says, hey, do you remember those dreams of the past of your forefathers? Do you remember how I appeared to Abraham and I said, said, I'm going to be with you and and you're going to have lots of kids. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. And I'm going to bless you so that you might be a blessing. And you remember how I was with your dad? And now, guess what? I'm going to be with you. And your offspring will be like the dust of the earth. They'll spread out to the north and to the south, the east and the west. You're going to have this great legacy. And Jacob, in that moment, was like, I've got a rock. It's tough to see this dream. It's tough to see this future. It's tough to see this moment, God, right now. But God, if, if you're with me, if you, you say you're with me and this is a place of refuge, this is a place where I can have some hope, this is some place where I can have some peace, this is a place where I can do something. The, the scripture tells us that he set that rock up in the morning. Nope, not that side. Whoa. It'll stay. See? <laughs> he set that rock up in the morning. He poured oil on it. And he made a commitment to God. He said, I'll give you 10% of everything I've got from now forever. Now, let's, let's just be honest for a minute. At that point, Jacob had his rock. He didn't have much. And I, I, I'm not great at math. I'm really confused by my kids' math these days. That new math, it, it, it really messes with my head. But even I can figure out that 10% of nothing is nothing. But Jacob says, I'm going to make this commitment. Because I've been living in my own strength. And commitment says that I'm willing to invest in something more. A preferred future. That I'm going to give something towards this dream that God has presented before me. That next week when I have some grapes, 10% of them belong to God. And the week after when I I have some wheat, 10% of that belongs to God. And and the week after when I have this and when I... Jacob makes this commitment to God. 
that says to him, God, I understand that you are my refuge and my strength, and it's not just about what I do and what I have. It's about this bigger vision of a world where people are invited to find refuge and strength in God. See, Jacob doesn't make a commitment to God. Jacob makes a, committed, a commitment to a changed life. And many of us have had our lives changed in this place by the power and presence of Jesus Christ. God with us. We found refuge and hope. And, and I understand, look, as I say the words commitment, many of us get a little bit uncomfortable. We are, as a society, we're, we're a little bit scared of commitment. Um, we see this all over. I mean, p- people don't stay in jobs for very long anymore. Uh, marriages are moving later and later in life because we, we kinda, we, we've kind of we got this FOMO, right? Fear of more options. We're, we're scared by what we, what, what we think could happen because we've been presented with all the options in the world. I can get on Amazon right now and I can, I can find... Thousands of options for whatever ails me. And they'll deliver it to my house. Sometimes in a day. What a strange and wondrous world we live in. But I've got all these options, and so I'm scared to commit to anything because something better might come along. Jacob could have said in this moment, like, "Uh, yeah, yeah, this was cool, God. Thank you so much for showing up and reminding me of the story of my people. Thank you for letting me have a moment of refuge. I don't know that I can give you what I've got. I don't know that I can give you any of my my time, my talents, my treasures. Because what if something better comes along? What if what if I need that time? What if I what if I need to to start a side hustle with my my, my talents? What if I what if I need that income to to do something else with? Jacob could have experienced what all of us experience: this idea of resistance. Stephen Pressfield, the the author of uh, The Legend of Bagger Vance, wrote a little book called The War of Art. It's a great little book, real short read. But but he says that anything that we do in life, whether it's uh, creating a a book or or, or whether we want to travel or whatever we want to do, it involves some level of commitment because we have to overcome resistance. All of us experience resistance as soon as we commit to some option. If I want to go on one of these great trips, if I want to see that place that I want to see, I might come up with the perfect plan. I know exactly where we're going. I know exactly where we're staying. I know exactly how long it's going to take, how much it's going to cost. I develop the perfect plan, but if I don't actually get in the car and go, I'm not really committed to it. And I'll never see that dream become a reality. I've got to overcome that resistance that says, you, you could do other things. You, you've got, you don't have enough time. You don't have enough resources. You don't have this. You don't have that. I've got to overcome that resistance in my life. Commitment allows us to do that. Not just commitment. Commitment to a dream. Commitment to a better future. Commitment that takes us further than we thought we could go. Jacob makes a commitment that this place of refuge, this place of God's presence, this place where he encountered God, it would be a part of his story and he would continue to tell it over and over and over and he would give of himself so that others might experience that same sort of refuge. We've been doing that in this place for almost 200 years. In this church, we've been giving of ourselves so that others might experience that same sort of life change, that same sort of refuge, that same sort of hope that we've experienced. We're not committing today just to put some money in the plate or just to to volunteer, to to serve in some way or to, to give of something that we're good at. We're committing to a dream together, to continuing to create a place, a place where people can encounter God, a 
place where people's lives can be changed by Jesus. We're committing to creating a place where where people can connect to one another and to their purpose in life. We're committing to a dream that has not yet become a reality. And that's what it takes. It's committing to something more. That's what gets us past that resistance. The resistance that I know we're feeling right now. So today, I want to invite you. Uh, We've been talking about dreams. We've been talking about this idea that these dreams compound, that that over time we we take the the dreams of the past and we leverage them for the future, for little Ian that we baptized today. We have dreams and hopes for him, for his generation, that they might experience the refuge and the peace, the life change that we have. And, and we're making a plan together to do that. But today, we're going to commit to that dream. A dream of being a place of refuge that impacts this community, this county, and around the world. We're going to dream a little dream together. And I want to invite you to bring these cards forward at, as an Ebenezer of sort, as a pillar, as a, as a marker, as a stone that says, we're committing together to this dream to see more than we ever could have imagined on our own. We're making a commitment to lives that will be changed to being a place of refuge, a place of hope right here in this space, in this place, and in so many others around our community and around the world. Let us raise an Ebenezer together. Let's invite others to experience the dreams and the life change that we have through Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? God, as we pause for this moment, as we're invited to come and to give of ourselves, to make a commitment to you and to the dreams that you have for this church, God, we pray that we would do it with open hands, that we would lean into you and not our own desires, our own will, our own hopes and dreams, God, but we would see your dream for a better future that we get to be a part of. God, move us now to overcome the resistance that we feel so that we might commit to you. pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.